In the 80s, we were very successful. I set up this business with a borrowed 500 quid and used a lot of tricks that I'd learned working for various horrible people, and it flew. And um, by 84, when this picture was taken, we were selling about 700 shops all over the world. And it was sort of Thatcher's Britain, and it was really frightening because she was just taking over. She was doing terrible things, smashing up the unions. There was the miners' strike. They were starving. She took away school milk, declared war on Argentina, um, best friends with Pinochet, and it was as if democracy slipped through our fingers. I thought, what can we do? I mean, this was a last-minute decision because I was invited to Downing Street to some stupid cocktail party, and I wasn't going to go. But I thought, amazing photo opportunity. Could get, you know, we could give a one anyway. Um, so I did, and I didn't realise it was going to be quite so well covered. But that was one of the first. And I thought, what would be actually hysterically funny? if it was copied, because, you know, it kind of pisses you off quite a lot. It actually takes the bread out of your mouth if somebody's ripped you off, makes it into dungeons in China, and then sells it to a third of your price. So I thought, well, let's just do something if they copy it, be hysterical. So I thought we'd do a load of huge print, t you know, slogans, social, environmental, political things that need to be addressed and put them on the t-shirts and hopefully they'll copy them. This was the first one, which is kind of really central to my life tenet. Um, it came from the Buddhist philosophy, uh, the Eightfold Path, which is trying to live your life properly. And one of the attributes is, you know, right livelihood. But choose life is actually central to that and I think is try to make it central to everything that I do. You know, they were out there in the beginning. But the problem, you know, we all think that marches and t-shirts and demos, you know, make a difference. But they, you know, they're all, all very well, they make you feel good. But in fact, what I realised is that unless you back them up with political action, they don't make any difference at all. They just give a feel-good factor to a bunch of us who are converted and actually sort of subvert our energy that we could use to make positive change and to make you feel as we've already done it when we haven't. I'm trying to be quick here with five minutes. Make trouble question everything. Quote got from 10, my, one of my favourite authors, Noam Chomsky, who is just the most brilliant and wonderful man. Um, and you know that's what we have to do: yeah. clean up or die. Well, that actually came from, you know, I've been doing these sort of 1982, three, four, five, um, because there were problems popping up with the environment, climate change. Greenpeace were talking about it, but in 1989, on the trying to check that we were in line with right livelihood. We did this research on the impact of the clothing and textile industry um, on the environment and socially, thinking we're going to find anything wrong. Of course, found myself up to my neck, as we all are in a complete nightmare of exploitation, slavery, environmental destruction. Um, the clothing industry is probably one of the biggest polluters in the world. There's about 35 million garment workers working in conditions worse than slavery, 100 million farmers um, starving to death. Um, and it still goes on. You know, there's a lot of blur about it, but not a lot changes really fundamentally at the bottom. Um, I used, you know, naked models. I can't go to anywhere with slogans across the, their bosoms in sort of sequins and diamante. This is Nomi. Um, use a condom because of the whole AIDS thing. Um, you know, people think it went away, but it didn't. There was sort of fashion for bareback sex, and um, we thought, well, this is, we've just got to get this message out really, really strongly. And of course, it was affecting Africa hugely. Um, and so she very kindly wore that. I can't actually go to China because I did sanction China for human rights abuses um, on sort of, some sort of naked models' of breasts. Um, so I'm not actually going to risk it. Um, because I think I'd end up in jail, which would be boring. Um, <laughs> pixie, stop this about human trafficking. Um, I could, it was like, I had a voice. I realised I had a voice and so they could use it for anything. Um, that upset me. Um, for instance, you know, police brutality in Ferguson. We just thought we'd do this don't shoot t-shirt, you know, front and back, because black people are getting shot in the back. And it's just the most appalling, untenable situation up there. I can't believe what's happening, how they're allowing the police to behave like this. Um, then I went to Mali in 03, and that's me in a cotton field, and I was absolutely shattered 
by what I saw there, the conditions of the farmers living in mud huts, uh, talking to farmers' wives who lost two babies at the breast because they were starving, because they were being screwed by the pesticide, could they, well, the cotton brokers, so also the agents of the pesticides, who won't give them a contract for their cotton, to sell their cotton unless they sign a contract for the pesticides. Um, if their crop fails because the pesticide doesn't work or it doesn't rain, um, the agents come, they bankrupt them, they take their tools and they become migrants. And these are the people that end up drowning in the Mediterranean. And you know, the complicity of Western governments, particularly the French, in the Francophone com uh, countries is mind-boggling. It's appalling. You cannot believe the inhumanity, the cruelty that goes on, and it just simply has to stop. Um, so, no more fashion victims. I'm actually here because I'm very interested in Fashion Roundtable and I got involved with an APPG in the Commons. And I want to, I've actually had an idea for legislation which I think really can nip this in the bud. And the brands don't care. Um, they're never going to drive it. They're going to whiffle waffle and give you loads of greenwash. But really, they quite like, you know, bad human rights, slave conditions, unpaid, enforced overtime. Because you know they can make more money that way. Chinese government official told me that big brands had actually approached them and said, "Don't improve, improve your human rights because it's going to put our making prices up." So um, you've got to avoid them. We need legislation that is driven by consumers, by people that care, and even the trade unions. My idea is very simple. We only allow goods into our economic blocks which are made to the same standards outside as inside on human rights, labour, health and safety, um, you know, obviously, you know, wages um, and environmental standards. And that with one sweep stops. Because it's the second time I put this idea out, this is the second time I had exactly the same reaction. I did talk to people in Amsterdam about this, and they said, you know, this is there were trade unions there, and they were really pleased. What it does is that it raises the cost of outsourced, but it actually makes their thereby making goods made within our economic lots more competitive. It stops the brands from bunny hopping from country to country to country as the human rights improve because it's universal, it protects the environment, and the argument against it is that, well, there'll be less women in Bangladesh, there's like three million women in Bangladesh making clothes, um, but, you know, for starvation wages. Pay them properly and you get a triple down economy, and this isn't a myth, it's actually happened in other countries. You have childcare, you've got cafes, you've got all sorts of other little service industries that spring up because they've actually got disposable income. So I'm hoping with the help of Fashion Roundtable and the APPG and some wonderful pro bono lawyers who are recruiting at the moment that we can write this legislation. And initially, I think we have to do it at EU level because please God, we remain in the EU. Uh, but we need it in the EU. And if we do Brexit, well then um, we're going to have to do it in the UK as well. But the EU is a massive economic block of 350 million consumers about to annex Japan, another 120 million of the richest consumers in the world. So that would do for a start. I've come here today to speak about basically the 9% of people that are represented in this whole influence, influential Instagram world that we're in right now. Uh, we are noticing that there's an influence on every corner. They're coming up every five minutes on Instagram with absolutely nothing of any interest to give anybody <laughs> to influence them on any level of any kind, but to show that they're wearing a Gucci sweater in partnership with Gucci. <laughs> now, I'm trying to understand what that means. After seeing this representation, of Catherine Hamlin showing you what a real influencer is supposed to be doing, which is influencing the public to read, to get involved in what's going on politically as well as, as what's not going on enough in a humanitarian point of view. This influencer situation, somebody's got to put a label on it. 
because now it's wasting everyone's time. We spend too much time already on this We all know that. Because we're trying to keep up with what's going on. If an influencer is being paid to influence their culture or their, you know, age group, they're going to have to come up with something a lot better than wearing a t-shirt or a sweater that they've been paid for. Because that's doing nothing for anyone that's following them but to go and buy that t-shirt for an overpriced cost, whatever. Anyway, what I'm trying to get a, a point across here is that um, maybe it's time for people to stop following influencers that are giving nothing back. Like I said, only 9% of the reality of, of, of all of us here is being represented in one influence. I mean, it's funny, I was at a, 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 a high powered, high fashion agenda in Paris last week. So it sounds a lot more than it really is. Um, and I ran into Virgil Alba, who is now uh, been um, advanced to be the head of Louis Vuitton's men. This is a luxury brand. It's a luxury brand that's kept alive by Africans and by people from um, different cultures. And finally, finally, they put someone in the house that actually represents the people that, is, that are keeping it going. Mm. You know, so that's one great achievement that I've seen happen. And he is an influencer. And what I've noticed is that as an influencer, he gives back to the community constantly. And he's constantly influencing them to up their game, to get it together, to go back to school, to learn not only about basketball and music, but about art, about not just street fashion, but high fashion. This is what an influencer should be doing. They should be um, pushing the youth culture to achieve a lot more than they're told they can achieve. And I think we are wasting time with these foolish influencers who are giving absolutely nothing to anyone of, of any kind and, and giving us no hope. All they're saying is, you don't have what I have. Is that the reality now of the influencer? I mean, I don't know if I consider myself an influencer. Maybe I do a little bit, but I noticed that my followers are great, basically young kids from the same kind of community I come from. And at least I'm giving them hope. Hope that they don't have to have, like I say, one job in basketball and one job in music, or a stripper, which is usually what's going on right or now. Or a boxer. Yeah, or a boxer, yeah, that's true. Uh, but they, they can say to themselves, right, I can learn, I can go back to school, I can travel, I can communicate in a different way, and I have something to offer so to the luxury market, not only, like I say, the street brands. So I think that everybody here has a responsibility, just like Catherine said, like Catherine's been showing us. Wear the t-shirt. If you see an influencer wasting time, say something on it. Have something more to say than just allowing things to just flow into nowhere because all this money is going to the wrong people. And it's about time that someone's being called out. I think this is the year of calling everybody out. <laughs> Time's up. Know what I, mean. I can't just say much more, but I think that to me is the standard that we now have to live by. When we see something that's working, we have to call it out. Thank you very much. I'm going to stand up because I can't see everybody when I'm sitting down. It's really important. I've just read 90 applications this week from women seeking a place on our mentoring programme. And these women are on a journey and they're seeking to have influence and a positive impact on others' lives in the same way as Tamara today is bringing us together to stretch our thinking. These women are all different, different <coughs> sectors, different organisations, from Boots to British Airways, from charity to civil servant, from fashion to farming, from varying wide, very, very wide, varying ethnic backgrounds, from 20 to 60. And alongside their values, what they have in common is a real desire to increase their confidence, to learn to speak and write 
so their voices can be heard. They want to understand how to be more visible and ultimately to be more successful in politics and public life, but not for their own glory, but to support others to have better lives. And as one of the founders of the Fabian Women's Network mentoring programme, this is exactly what we are seeking to achieve. We want to hear more women's voices at every layer of government, more women's voices in the boardroom of charities, of the public sector, of the private sector. We want to listen to more women speaking on TV and see them in print. We want women, more women decision makers and influencers reflecting the makeup of the world that we live in and improving others' lives. But many women, and indeed men too, are held back or hold themselves back by negative voices in their lives or negative voices in their heads. Mm. They've been told, you're not good enough, that's not what girls do, or that's not what women do. Or they say to themselves, I, I can't do that. And they don't always receive the encouragement they need. And some of the women do not have the networks or the contacts or the navigating tools we need and they see more and more men in positions of influence. So what we do in this mentoring programme, we have like a crucible, I think, of it. So we select cohorts, about 28 women, 25, 28 women, making sure we've got the right age range, the right, you know, the mixture of backgrounds and the variety of experience. And at the start of the 10-month programme, the women, all suffer from a terrible dose of imposter syndrome. Mm, huge. They think, oh, why have I been chosen? I'm just not good enough. Everybody else is better. That's what you've just heard. I've written it earlier. They're expecting someone to tap them on the shoulder and say, go back home where you belong. And we see some women hiding behind their hair. Yeah. And we hear little voices. <laughs> not from here, but up here. So into the program mix, we put, we try and match individuals as closely as we can with their mentors. And obviously looking at what the women want to achieve. They don't all want to be MPs at all. They want to have more influence in their chosen field. The skills range that we bring together is so, so important. And so is the experience working alongside other people, share, sorry, I'm jumping around for your camera, but never mind. Um, we all need mentors at different stages of our lives. And we all need to work alongside people who've got different skills. The crossroads that we face don't stop the need to make choices about how we spend our time don't stop as we get older. And in fact, in some ways, it gets a little bit more challenging as you get older. But what I love about the programme, what I love about you two being here together today, is that women can act as peer mentors and support to each other. The women who are organising the march, who knew each other, who met each other on the mentoring mm. programme. Mm. We can be peer supporters to each other. We can act as cheerleaders. So on the programme, we encourage skill sharing rather than competition. Mm. Celebration of achievement of every size. And we offer each other opportunities in the same way as Tamara has done today, to invite us here to share this wonderful opportunity, this brilliant space. We show women that the space at the shadow cabinet table or the boardroom table belongs to them. Yeah. They have the right to occupy that space 
in the same way as we have the right to be here today. But we need that kind of confidence instilled in us to say, yes, I have the right to enter into the House of Commons. It belongs to me. I have the right to develop myself to sit at the boardroom table. But we do voice coaching. Very, very important. I'm now going to plant myself and show how to do it. So voice coaching, absolutely critical for so many of us. So we know how to breathe, to pause, and to use different voices to great effect. We all need to understand how to speak to occupy different spaces, how to speak in different circumstances. So we do public speaking and debating. So you learn how to express yourself and understand others' viewpoints. That's critical. If you're part of a panel, to listen, to understand, to accept different viewpoints and to know if you are going to go into politics, how to stand on that doorstep, not the door and canvas. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> we run sessions on how to network and how to be seen. So if you go to a conference and you want to meet everybody, you look at a list and you think, wow, I really would love to meet all those people. It's very simple. You stand up to ask a question and get yourself noticed. But if you are wearing a black dress, mm -hmm. no apologies to those of you wearing black dresses. <laughs> but if you're sitting next to somebody with a black dress, next to somebody else with a black <laughs> dress, then how can the person who's chairing it, because they're not going to say, uh, and the person with the blonde hair and the glasses. But if, however, you put on a pink jacket or, or something, then the speaker says, yeah, you with a pink jacket. It's true. You know what I'm saying. I know, it's true. So it's really important to wear something that gets you picked out in the conference crowd. And once that happens, then people come up to you. They want to talk to you. Journalists want to listen to you. I'm just going to have a little sip of water. I'm talking without drinking, which is important, I know. OK, so once you know how to network and how to meet journalists and how to pitch an article and write an article which is published, then your voice is heard and your influence spreads. You know that. Anybody who's actually met journalists, who's been on TV, once you do that, that's it, you're being made. Once you know how to put your, vo your viewpoint across and you're asked to appear on TV or the radio and you do it well, you get invited back. Now, critically, what happens on this programme is these women form a network between them. We've had now, uh, we're just about to have eight cohorts, we've got over 200 powerful women who can reach out to each other and reach beyond. So the impact is huge. We've got women who are counsellors, we've got 40 counsellors, women who are trustees, women who are influential in the UN, etc. Thank you, thank you so much for having me here. I've learned so much already and I'm so pleased that I didn't wear my black dress. <laughs> um, but that's so true because uh, Mr Speaker in Parliament yep. is definitely calls you more quickly yep. if you have a bright colour on yeah. now. I'm sure it's not subliminal, and you probably disagree with me for saying that, um, because I'm sure there's an orderly way it's done in Parliament, but I know when I wear something bright and, st and that stands out, it's much more easy, easily um, for him to notice that I'm there and to call my name. And uh, funnily, on uh, one of the days at PMQs, I wore this green dress, which I thought was lovely and I was very pleased with myself. I was sitting there and I got a text from my husband who said, you do realise your head looks suspended above the green seats in Parliament because no one can see you've got a body. <laughs> so uh, we have so much to learn from the fashion world in Parliament, we really do. Uh, but I was a psychologist, as uh, Tamara says, before coming into Parliament.
Parliament. So I had absolutely no plan to be there whatsoever. Um, I was very happy in my job. And uh, it, it was over time that more and more people were coming to see me whose issues uh, were badged as mental health issues, but they were really about um, social justice, social inequality issues, homelessness, uh, financial problems, living with austerity. And I began to think, actually, therapy isn't going to you know, help them in totality here because there's so many social issues that need to be dealt with alongside uh, the other issues and the clinical issues. Uh, so I began to become interested in politics, started to go along uh, to our local branch uh, meetings uh, just after the referendum. And, um, the Scottish referendum. Yes, not not we weren't at the Brexit one by that point. Actually, <laughs> we still had that to come. Um, so just after the Scottish referendum, and uh, started to go along to the meetings, and they said, "Well, we we need someone to stand. No one ever really stands from this branch. Just put your name forward and don't worry about it because in a few years' time you might get to stand. You know, get." In, to be in the council, the local council. So I said, okay, that sounds fine. I'll put my name forward. I <laughs> uh, went back home and told my husband, well, I'll put my name forward, but don't worry about it at all because in a few years' time, I'll you know, maybe stand for council and that, that would be um, something I could contribute locally. Then uh, it came to the time of uh, having what's called a husting. So you have to sort of speak and see what you would like to do. And of course, um, there's lots of career politicians, aren't there? So, you know, many um, people who wanted to be MPs had political backgrounds, but I didn't have a political background as such. So I felt a bit out of my depth in terms of uh, speaking in a, a high fluting political manner. Uh, but I just spoke about mental health, about the work I was doing, etc. And I don't know what happened, but um, at the ballot, I ended up being the candidate. So. <laughs> I then had to go home to my husband and they said, it's all right, you're the candidate, but you know, SNP hasn't won this seat before, so you'll be absolutely fine. Um, <laughs> in a few months' time after the campaign, you go back to your normal life. And uh, so I said, that's fine. So I, I, I mean, I, I treated it extremely seriously because by this point, I felt a lot of people were relying on me to, um, to be the lead of the campaign. Uh, so I took some time off work to do it and uh, you know, started chapping the doors and the response we were getting was very, very positive and I started to think, actually, I, I could be elected here. <laughs> so, um, amazingly, um, I went back to my husband and said, well, you know, there is a chance that I could be elected down to Westminster and our lives might be turned upside down. He said, yes, I think I've gathered. I don't listen to you anymore <laughs> about the outcome of this, but carry on because whatever is meant to happen will happen. And uh, I think through that process, um, and the First Minister in Scotland had uh, a mentoring programme actually for candidates, uh, male and female, uh, in order to support us along the process. And that helped me to find my voice. And I entered into Westminster in 2015 and thought, well, you know, I'm here and I'm here for a reason and I want to make um, a difference because I, I've given up my career as such. Um, I want to try to use my time really productively. So I focused uh, initially on chairing the, the Disability All Party Group in Parliament. We've done a lot of work uh, through the group in terms of raising questions, the types of, of, of things that we've discussed tonight, um, having debates on disability empowerment, uh, contribution to the economy, uh, and Brexit and disability rights, etc. And very much enjoyed that. And we've now, um, I've convinced uh, Mr. Speaker to uh, extend his internship programme to include uh, places every year, additional places that are paid for interns in Parliament who have disabilities because we're really underrepresented yep. in uh, that area in Parliament as in many areas of inequality still exists. So every year now, um, from now on, Parliament has taken it on officially now, there will be uh, interns uh, who have uh, disabilities or mental health issues coming into Parliament to work with MPs, to learn about politics, to hopefully want to go on, um, maybe to run for council, maybe, who knows, to become MPs, or to work in policy, to, or to just to find their voice and, and, and have 
uh, more empowerment. So I've been doing that, just also finished the Ivory Bill, because funnily enough, when you come into politics, all of a sudden you have you do have a voice actually mm -hmm. and back in my university days I was very very passionate about and still am animal rights it's something that I sort of lost along the way when I developed a career and didn't uh, become so actively involved but that's come back to me so very very pleased to have led on the ivory bill in the past couple of weeks that's that's gone through and uh, you know it's a historic bill really and um, that will contribute greatly to uh, saving elephant uh, populations for future generations, which is important to me and uh, to my children. And uh, I want to see a world um, with elephants forever. So that, that's something that I um, wanted to contribute to. Uh, also chair the Dog Welfare Group, uh, and we've been working on Lucy's Law, which um, we are very hopeful will go through the legislative process in the next few months, and that's for a ban on third-party puppy sales uh, in pet shops. And also it's part, uh, the third-party sales are, are part of the mechanism that allows puppy farms across the UK and beyond to continue because people are able to sell the puppies away from the mother, um, which isn't good for the welfare of the dog, but it also means the public who think they're buying a puppy that's been reared in good conditions don't know where the puppy has come from. Uh, so we're hoping that that will come through. And that takes me on to fashion and uh, textiles too, because when I came back into Parliament in 2017 after the election, um, I decided, yes, um, I'm going to join the fashion and textile group that was already there, uh, because I've always had an interest in uh, textiles. It's huge, obviously, in Scotland, and uh, fashion and textiles um, is, is always been an interest of mine, actually. Uh, so I thought, well, I'll join it and I'll do something as well that I can uh, contribute to. And then I couldn't find it. I know. <laughs> um, because it, it hadn't been running for so many years. I know. So I, I said, well, that's fine. By that point, I had started chairing a number of the groups. So I thought, well, I'll just, I'll just start it again. And that's when we met. And since then, things have taken off. We've had a number of parliamentary questions. Uh, I've spoken uh, to... Um, after the Commonwealth event that we had, I've spoken to Penny Mordaunt, Secretary of State for DFID, and uh, we've spoken about Commonwealth Fund and how that might um, lend itself to some of the aims of the session that we had. Uh, I've also raised the issue um, of Brexit uh, with Prime Minister this week, and we're hoping eventually um, to have a debate on fashion and textiles and Brexit in uh, probably in September um, or just after the conference recess. Mm. Uh, so we must keep it on the agenda. It's not been on the agenda no. as such in Parliament. People are amazed because when you look at the figures, um, the contribution to the economy of this industry is massive. But we're spending uh, the majority of our time talking about cars and other areas of the industry. It's valid to talk about those areas, but it's equally valid to speak about textile and fashion. It's brilliant that once you have one person and you've gathered a, um, a cohort of MPs and Lords and Peers and it, and it just means that that conversation becomes normalised so that we're actually in the space because uh, pharmaceuticals, cars, fishing are spoken about an awful lot and fashion is like, oh yes, whatever, or well, oh, not even in the room, was it? It's not even been in the room. There are two ways you can see fashion and or or the creative arts and I think that one of them is, is an industry and talk about trade which is of course it's really important um, but there's another way which is that it's kind of a way to access the cultural mainstream mm -hmm. and um, when, I'm, when I work, I work um, Gareth is also my husband which is great sometimes um, but uh, it's kind of we work together it's very intense but the reason that we do what we do is not to be part of an industry it doesn't interest us in any way. What interests us is being part of a cultural conversation. So when I first met him, he, he was already shown, um, and I had a lot of, actually had a lot of disdain for the fashion industry um, for, for all the reasons that everyone can imagine. But when I first saw his first show, I realised that the impact, the impact it could have, um, the impact that it had on me, and how how potent a tool that was. 
then take that forward and take it to a different place. And it took years because Gareth was always very apolitical. He didn't want to have any kind of political freight within his work. He thought that him doing his work in the first place was enough because it was so hand to mouth and it was like we were making a point. Um, but then over, the, I mean, we've been together now for 11 years and we've worked together for seven. And over those seven years, we gradually started to introduce um, like very subtle political messaging until you know certain events that have happened over the past couple of years have really energized everyone and um and i guess it's a, it's a cliche to say it now but there is like a veil that was lifted and suddenly these systems of repression that have always been there are suddenly extremely visible and um we 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 had a period a, a quite a difficult personal period um in 2016 and it was because I could feel that something was happening around us that was that was important to me. And it was he. I think that um, he was very reluctant to, reluctant to engage in, in having any kind of political commentary in his work. But things got so bad that it that it became impossible to ignore, mm. and a lot of people did. And it's kind of. We had a, one particular season. It was um, it was oh, one or seventeen. We did a show. It was basically providing people with a, an image of the rise of fascism, which if you, my head to my co-founder of Power Movement last night, we were going through what we would like to present on Friday, the Trump protest, and that is that we're going to present, these are the signs that indicate that, fasc that, that we're looking at the rise of fascism. And they come, the, the, the reference tale she gave me is from the Holocaust Museum, and every single one is applicable to certain things that are happening right now. So. We, we went through this difficult period in 2016. I decided that I wanted to go to Washington for the election. And I didn't, we never really knew what was happening. We knew it was like a crunch moment. And I kind of, I needed to be there. And Gareth came with me and we came back and we did this show. And the show was, the show was really, really aggressive. And it was really strong and it was direct and there was no fucking about. And it was like, we used, we used the, we used, um, we basically use the CIA um, interrogation technique for the soundtrack, which is the the last array all these different tracks of like heavy metal, and they put them all together, and is to keep people awake. And we did that for the show, and it was it was a moment yeah. where I realized that actually something we we there's something else happening, and we can we can achieve we have a different kind of conversation, and it was extremely moving, and that led to a really serious commitment to follow up on on what that, that feeling that we discovered at that, that moment. And so Het and I started to attend meetings that were basically to combat the rise of the far right. They were they were organized by all different organizations, Movement for Justice, um, a Stop Trump Coalition, all these organizations that were some of which were doing amazing work but they were very, very um, they were very suspicious of outsiders, they weren't very welcoming, they weren't very open. Um, the, and for good reason. Um, and then other organizations like the Stop Trump Coalition where we would go to meetings and there would be a lot of talk and it would be a lot of talk about America, but nothing about what was happening here. Mm. And so we eventually decided that the only way to actually achieve anything would be to, to start something ourselves. And we didn't know, we didn't know anything. We, we knew very little, but we knew that we, we knew that something was happening, something had to be done. And um, and so with some of the people we had met through those networks, we we established a small group, who who were trying to figure out what it is, how you can affect change when you don't have any experience within the mechanics of the structures or that are around you that, that people usually use like like politics or how, how do we do it? And basically the the thing that came out of it is that. It's about taking personal responsibility and identifying in what you do in the in, in your daily life what your raw power is. Everyone has raw materials to contribute to resistance. Everyone has raw materials to contribute to fighting a good fight. Everybody, um, no matter like, I mean, like it's, I feel I have a touch of imposter syndrome. Oh, I have it here, hugely. But like with Catherine, I mean, it's like you saw it's just an icon to us, and it's but what you did with that first image. That's a reference that we always go back to because it's like, yeah. like it's it needs to be the time for hiding is over, and there needs to be a sense of urgency. And when when we were talking together, that small group, what we realized is that 
the creative industries, I don't see myself as a fashion person, which I know is daft because I work with a fashion designer, but I see myself as a creative person and as a creative person, you, you're you kind of like a Swiss army knife. I mean, there's all these like, different functions that you can achieve, but you don't know that you can achieve them until you put yourself in a different kind of context. And the event that um, Tamara was talking about was in the year anniversary of Trump's election. It was at Somerset House. How the fuck did they get Somerset House to agree to do this? I don't know. We got Budweiser as a sponsor, the king of beers. You know what I mean, it's like, it's crazy. <laughs> um, and we basically took over and we never paid for anything because because something there was there was, a, there was a, if you tap into that feeling of that if everyone can actually contribute something if everyone can be part of a movement you don't have to call it, it doesn't have the thing about raw power is that it's people led and we don't have an agenda it's not party affiliated it's non-profit it's basically just it's kind of a provocation it's like what 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 have you got that you can share that you can offer to 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 fight back because things are really bad and that some of the things that we tried to explore in that event was the one of them was the idea that all oppression is interlinked and that you have to be aware of that all the time and and go through a process of of dealing confronting your own privilege in, in in every aspect of your life which is hard but it has to be done and it's so much harder for the people who are who are living under those systems of oppression which exist now do you know what i mean right here right now um, so that was the main thing that we wanted to do and the way we did that was by putting images in people's faces yeah. when they never expected, they never asked for it, they thought they were coming like a party, I guess, I don't know, like a fashion party because of who was involved and what they got was a punch in the face. And I think that that is, it was necessary, it wasn't exploitative, it was necessary, but that was just one moment and our third co-founder, her name is um, Nizrit Faisula, She's, she comes from the social sector, so there's two of us in the creative sector and there was one from the social sector and then the, another group around us. And she she works in an uh, area called systems change, you know, I, I'd never heard of this before before we met Niz. And systems change is basically exactly what you said, Catherine, how do you get past it being a feel-good moment? How do you get past giving someone a hand job and it actually being something that lasts? And that, that creates change that that you that, that can be done in, in really unexpected ways. Like the system, the idea of like the system being fragile, is something else that we want to explore mm -hmm. in that event because it was in the first in the first part of the event. It was a punch in the face. It was it was putting together images of xenophobia from from. Um, like from the Holocaust, with the same, with the same, the exact same formation of imagery used by U, by um, by UKIP, and in, in, in their advertising campaigns, side by side, exactly the same. Um, it, and to highlight that and to put it in people's faces. And also, it was global because you had the yeah. room with the imagery of um, homophobia happening in Russia. There yeah. was a video footage, and I found that really really hard to yeah. deal with you had what's the black lives matter but it was very but what was interesting and then you had the i, I left before that bit but you because i have a child and i always <laughs> leave early now but you had the bit with the room where the performance artists you, yeah. Yeah, and you and you also got the mag you got the fashion magazines or the cultural yeah. magazines involved um and you did that again when you did an event recently i took my son I had Zimba hair, and I turned up with my my son, and we did pro we did a protest little uh, thing, and then ID were there, and I was like, oh great, I'm feeling really fabulous. So I'm like, but he's cute; he can go in front. But you engage our our world in a in a conversation that changes their perspective, which means that the the reader or the consumer is engaging in yeah. a different way. I mean, that was that was Nick Knight. He gave us a space that we could use. It's like their offices, they have like a pho photographic code, big space that we could use because we asked the question and basically that event was, it was about building a community um, it's about people having a new space for conversation because activists on the whole in the social sector and the creative sector never get in the same room yeah. and when they do it's explosive and it's powerful and there's so much, there can be so much power in the spaces.